Hello, welcome. This is the Lichen Sclerosis Podcast. My name is Kathy, and this is my journey of learning about and living with lichen sclerosis. I am a patient. I have lichen sclerosis, and I research every week some kind of information to bring back to help us understand this disease, disorder better, and help build community. I do not hold a medical degree, so any information I give you is just so you can talk to your doctor and be better informed. So this week, we're going to talk about the misdiagnosis of lichen sclerosis. Obviously, they can't tell us how many cases of lichen sclerosis are out there and are being misdiagnosed at the moment, but... According to the Association for Lichen Sclerosis and Vulval Health, which we learned about last episode, the ALS-VH, an estimated 1% to 3% of women around the world have LS. Many will be diagnosed before they found out their true issue. I know I did. I'm sure you have a similar story If you don't, you're one of the lucky ones that was able to be diagnosed right away. But this is a common occurrence. And it all boils down to the doctors and the clinicians not being properly trained. According to Dr. Elizabeth G. Stewart, an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Harvard Medical School, more than 10% of office visits are due to vaginal symptoms and 16% of American women have chronic vulvular pain. The problem is there's virtually no vulvular training for doctors. Not only that, There's like a dozen different disorders and diseases that present with very similar symptoms. And a lot of doctors aren't even going, having the patients come in to see them. They're taking the information over the phone, diagnosing them blind, recommending treatments because they feel like, oh, we know what they have. There's no need for them to come in. And then the Women are just taking these treatments, not getting better, getting frustrated, not going back to the doctor, just feeling like, okay, well, I'm just going to live with this until it gets so bad that now we have a larger issue and they end up having to go back to the doctor because their symptoms are 10 times worse, where if the doctor had caught it early, it could have been treated and they would have been in a much better situation knowing what they had, and treating it accordingly. We all know, because we've lived it, time and time again, how we have been misdiagnosed until somebody finally says, hmm, I think you got lichen sclerosis. Let's test this. And then we come to finally, after years and years of suffering, to find we finally have a name for what is ailing us. I have been on forums. I've read articles after articles and studies after studies of ladies who have been diagnosed for years to the point that uh, some of them have developed vulval cancer. I'm going to share a story with you on a very courageous lady uh, in a little bit. First, let's talk about all of the diagnoses that we get before we get our LS diagnosis. Uh, I have personally been uh, diagnosed with some of these, and I will also be sharing that story today. So let's see, Uh, we have been diagnosed with yeast infections, Uh, Children have been diagnosed with child abuse, genital herpes, genital bacterial infection, uh, decreased pigmentation or lightening of the skin, hypoallergenic. Oh, that's a big one. Oh, you're just allergic to your new detergent. I ain't changed my detergent. Okay, your soap? No. 
Uh, well, it's something. But yeah, we've heard that one, right? Lichen plant planus. I'm going to make a, a separate episode uh, between the differences of lichen sclerosis and lichen planus, uh, or oral lichen planus, and vulvular cancer. Those are some of the diagnoses that we get instead of LS. Now, what happens if you are suffering from LS and you go misdiagnosed for years and years and years? Well, unfortunately, one in 20 women with untreated vulvular lichosclerosis will develop skin cancer due to scar tissue. That's sad. That's why it's important to be properly diagnosed and see a doctor every six to 12 months. Now, I am not going to tell you that I am good at at seeing the doctor because I haven't seen a doctor in two years. I know I'm so ashamed to say it out loud, but I will be making an appointment very soon and um, going back to the gynecologist. I'm just got frustrated and I got disillusioned with them not really giving me answers. And I'm, I know I'm not the only one that feels this way, but I have to start holding them accountable. I can't just, you know, stick my head in the sand anymore. It's not healthy. And reading more and more about this uh, disease and how it can progress, I'd never want it to get to that point, especially if all it took was me going to the doctor and taking the right medication. So I am advocating for us to see the doctor every six to 12 months, depending on how bad your symptoms are and getting informed and holding the doctors accountable because we do not want to get to a worst case scenario. And if you are at a worst case scenario, you want to be able to get better. Absolutely. So undiagnosed lichen sclerosis can lead to reoccurrent lower urinary tract infections excessive sweating, non-healing lesions, skin ulcers that look like herpes, uh, vulval lip shrinking, clitoral scarring, vaginal narrowing, vaginal bruising, urination pain, and pain or bleeding during intercourse. So I want to tell you about Claire Baumhauer. Her story was in Vice, uh, February of last year, February 5th of last year. I'll have a link to the article on the website. And she is actually now very uh, active on Twitter. Her Twitter handle is Volvel Cancer UK. And I recommend if, you know, you're not embarrassed, uh, to go and follow her. So as a young girl, uh, starting in elementary school, she had soreness and itching on her vulva. Her mom took her to the doctor and to the doctor and to the doctor, and they gave her different creams and nothing helped. So she ended up just living with it like most of us. So for 40 years, she was misdiagnosed. She, they told her she had yeast infection, cyst, early menopause, eczema, herpes. Eventually, she was diagnosed with vulval cancer. And it was caused by untreated lichen sclerosis. She said, looking back, she had the classic lichen sclerosis symptoms, itching, white patches. And she went to the doctor multiple times. She had two children. She had pap smears every three years and no one ever picked up on her lichen sclerosis. She said she's seen a doctor at least 30 times with the same symptoms. And most of them didn't even look at her vulva. They just listened to the symptoms, said, oh, I know what you got and decided to prescribe her with something. How she finally got diagnosed is she developed a tear, a fissure that turned into an ulcer. It got so big 
she eventually went to her doctor and her doctor had the nerve to tell her that she had herpes. When she looked at the doctor funny, like, uh, no, I've been with my husband for 25 years. Her doctor finally took another look and told her it could be vulva cancer. Um, They did a biopsy and found out that she had LS, which led to the vulva cancer. So since uh, the diagnosis, she has had numerous operations, 30 sessions of radiotherapy for her cancer. It went from stage one to stage three. It spread to her lymph nodes. And eventually she has, uh, as of last year, she was 18 months into remission, but they told her she only had a 40% chance to survive for five years or more. All of this probably could have been prevented if she had been diagnosed with LS earlier. Now she says, quote, if I had been diagnosed with lichen sclerosis as a child, been treated, monitored all my life, I might still have got cancer, but I definitely would have gone back to my general practitioner much sooner and the cancer could have been caught earlier. (sighs) These doctors do not understand how they frustrate us to the point where we don't want to see them no more. But we have to get out of that mindset and we have to hold them accountable. If that one is not giving us what we need, we need to find another one and another one and another one until we find the one that is going to treat us and make us whole again. So my story has some similarities to Claire's. At 35, I had a hysterectomy uh, because for three months I had been bleeding and spotting uh, continuously. And after my hysterectomy, they did a biopsy and find out and and found out that I had uh, fibroids. So after my histo, I started itching. Uh, I didn't notice it at first. And after my first follow-up, which I believe was about six weeks later, I want to say, um, four or six weeks later, I didn't mention it to the doctor because I it was slight and it wasn't something that I really noticed. When I went back for my one-year checkup, I definitely had noticed the itching. And I told the doctor uh, about the itching. He kind of, you know, brushed it off. He's like, oh, maybe it's just your soap. You know, you you should be fine. So I was like, all right. I didn't have any other symptoms. It was just an itching. And my itching only persists when I was laying down, when I was getting ready to go to sleep. It never happened when I was out and active, standing or sitting or anything. It was just when I was laying down, getting ready to go to sleep. So it didn't really affect my life at this point to where I I made a big deal out of it. So some time goes on and it got worse. It was like a year and a half later, I went to go get uh, another pap from a different doctor and told her about the itching. Now it had gotten to the point where it was making me um, uncomfortable before I was going to sleep. It was uh, to the point where I was itching so bad. I was scared I was going to scratch myself um, and I would try not to use my nails. So she, you know, looked me over, did my pap and everything. And she very calmly told me, oh, you probably have an allergy. Um, Did you change your detergent? Did you change your soaps? And I told her we hadn't. But she said a lot of women develop a sensitivity uh, after, you know, surgery or as they get older. So she recommended I use a sensitive a vaginal wash. So I did. I changed to Vagisil. I didn't use soap 
in that area and it did not help. I was still itching. It was still stopping me from going straight to sleep. And now I was scratching so badly that I was making holes in my underwear. Not only was I itching, I was very sweaty down there. Uh, I would have days where my underwear looked like I peed in them because it was so sweaty. It was just uncomfortable to wear underwear. I would have to sleep without underwear so that I could fall asleep because of the itching and the sweating. It was starting to become a daily struggle. But I didn't want to go back to the doctor because I didn't want to be told again, oh, you're just having an allergy. Shortly after that, I started to notice that my labia was drooping more, like it was just hanging. And they started to take on this white ashen kind of look. It kind of freaked me out. So I asked my husband about it. He wasn't concerned. He was just like, it looks fine to me. So I didn't think about it anymore. I was like, well, you know, he looks at it more than I do. So <laughs> so it must not be nothing major. Then I developed my first, I want to call it a boil because have you ever got burnt and then you had that raised skin with like um, the water underneath and like a thin ball of skin with the water? It was like that but it was on my labia right below my clitoris. At first, I thought it was a hair bump. I just figured, okay, well, you know, I've had hair bumps before. It'll go away. It was a week later. It did not go away. Now it was starting to become painful and it was growing. And so I finally asked my husband to look at it. It was about two or three weeks. No, maybe, maybe about two weeks before I asked him to look at it because I I tried to look with a mirror and it was in an awkward position. So he looked at it and I said, honey, I think I have a hair bump. Can you look at it? And so he looked and he was like, uh, babe, I don't think that's a hair bump. And it don't look like no hair bump I've ever seen. So then I'm like, what? So I said, well, take a picture so I can see it. He took a picture and then I looked at it and I was like, oh, good Lord, what the hell is that? And that's when I got scared. I was really, really scared. I was like, oh my God, do I have cancer? What is this on my body? And why is it not going away? Why does it hurt? This is not normal. So I decided right then that I was gonna go back to the doctor. I made the decision to go back to my original gynecologist who did my hysterectomy and uh, he wasn't available. In order for me to get in right away, I had to see the nurse practitioner. So I was like, fine, I I need to see somebody. This is not normal. I went in, I saw her as she was examining me. um, I was telling her about the boil or ulcer or whatever you want to call it. And that I thought it might be cancer. She said she didn't think it was cancer. So she cut it open to see what it, if it was filled with pus. But it wasn't. It was filled with blood and water. So she said she wanted to take a biopsy. Okay, that's fine. Let's find out what the hell this is. So she called the gynecologist in. Now, this is my original doctor's wife. They have a practice together. So I'd never seen this lady before. She walks in, looks in between my legs and says, oh, that looks like a herpes wart. Say so, what? Well, you you just gonna walk in here, look at in between my legs and tell me I have herpes? You don't know me. You didn't ask me about my history. You, nothing. And she, she seemed annoyed, I guess, because they were... Granted, they were busy. That's why I was seeing the nurse practitioner. It was close to the end of the day. But she just walked in all nonchalant. like, oh, yeah, that looks like a herpes wart. So the nurse was like, well, I want to take a biopsy. And the doctor was like, well, you can't take a biopsy because you've messed up the tissue too much when you cut into it. So you can't take a biopsy now. 
but uh, treat her for herpes. <laughs> and walked out. Okay. The nurse practitioner, she looks at me, looks at that, at the, uh, at the boil, and she says, I don't think that that is herpes. Now, mind you, I've been with my husband at this point for almost 20 years. So I know people cheat, but I trust my husband. I just knew in my hearts of hearts, I didn't have herpes. I had no other symptoms. I didn't have any discharge. I didn't have any foul smell. Um, None of that. So the nurse practitioner says, give me a minute. I think I have an idea of what you might have, but I want to do some research. I said, okay. So I laid there while she went to the computer. She looked some stuff up and she turned around and she says, I think you have lichen sclerosis. Have you ever heard of lichen sclerosis? I said, no, I've never heard of that word in my life or those words in my life. So she says, well, it's an autoimmune disease. I'm looking at your skin. I'm looking at the discoloration and the elongation of your labia. Um, and sometimes you, they, you get boils with LS. So I said, oh my God, I completely had forgot about my other symptoms. I never told her about the itching or the discoloration or anything because I did not put them together. To me, this boil was all on its own. I, it never, I never connected it to the rest of my symptoms. So she says, have you been itching? And I said, oh my God, have I been itching? I've been itching for years. I've been trying to find somebody to tell me why I've been itching for years. She says, yeah, one of the main symptoms of lichen sclerosis is itching. Some patients itch so bad that they uh, scratch holes in their underwear. And I was like, girl, I just happened to wear the one of the two or three that I had left that didn't have holes in them. And so we both laughed and So she says, I'm going to give you this cream. And she told me how to put it on. She said, I'm going to see you in two weeks. If you are better in two weeks, then you have lichen sclerosis. So I said, okay, fine, perfect. That's all she said. So I come back with, okay, so is the cream going to cure it? She says, no, it's not curable. There's no cure, but it will treat it. (sighs) <sighs> that's when I kind of got like a little lightheaded because I'm thinking, are you telling me now I have to live with this for the rest of my life? Are you serious right now? Wow. Wow. I was devastated. I had been living with this for almost five years. It was getting progressively worse. And now you're telling me I would never be rid of it. I didn't know how to feel. She says, well, let's see how the medicine does and come back and we will go from there. So I said, okay. I leave, go to get my medication. Of course, there's an issue there. Uh, The pharmacy tells me that the medicine that the doctor called in is not covered by my insurance and they have to contact the doctor to get a different prescription. So all of that is now taking place over the weekend. Monday comes, I now have my new prescription. I can start my medication. But unfortunately, Over the weekend, I get so sick. It's flu season. I think I have gotten something that's close to the flu. If it's not the flu, I am with fever and I'm shivering. This outbreak, this boil, wart, whatever you want to call it, is now so inflamed Remember, she's cut it open. So now it's an open sore and I'm 
feel like I'm getting a, a whole nother one on my other labia. I am sick and I'm in pain and it is excruciatingly painful because I can't really close my legs and I can't wear underwear because I'm sweating profusely down there, but I'm also sweating from the fever. It's just not, it's an all around, not a good time. Finally, I get better. I had to push my appointment back a week. So after three weeks of using the medicine, I'm feeling better. My symptoms have pretty much gone away. My boil has, or whatever you want to call it, has gone away and I'm happy. I go to the doctor. Um, I see the nurse practitioner again. I tell her, thank you so, so much because now I have a name to what I have. All she says is, awesome. I'm so glad you're better. Keep taking the medicine when you have an outbreak and come for your annual checkup. That's it. That's all, folks. She sends me out into the world no brighter, no smarter about this disease. For two years, I did just that. I used my medicine whenever I got a little itchy. My labia went back to its normal appearance, its normal color, its normal shape. I did not have any more boils or lesions or whatever you want to call them. And uh, I lived a normal life until about a month ago when I got my first fissure and I was in so much pain. My medicine wasn't working anymore and I didn't know what to do except live with it, grow frustrated, and want to talk to somebody, but I didn't have anybody to talk to. Hence the birth of the Lichen Sclerosis Podcast. So that I could find you and the rest of our community. And we can talk to each other and share with each other and not be embarrassed. So that's my story. Please email me, talk to me, share your stories with me, and hopefully I can have you share your story on the podcast. I would love to grow this community and have more voices be heard because there's a lot of us and we all have our own story. Some of them may be similar Some of them may be way different, but we all need to be heard. So once again, shoot me an email, lichensclerosispodcast at gmail.com. Check out the website, lichensclerosis.com. Don't forget to subscribe so that you can be notified when we get, when I drop the next episode. And I hope you have a fabulous week. I will see you then. Bye.